Here's a question I want you to deal with, and we have some others coming from an audience of people. But first, Dr. Flick, if you could deal with this, there's a lot of talk about tolerance. And what is the difference between tolerance and religious liberty? Tolerating things and truly having religious liberty. It's one of uh, a personal opinion. Uh, we, would, we would believe that our convictions, I trust, would arise out of scripture and override uh, personal opinion, as we heard from Roger Williams this morning. Um, so uh, that's, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about what drives us, and it is the passions many times that we're seeing in our society. Uh, and our founding fathers, again, they turned to religious standards. It wasn't just personal ethics, personal morality. They had objective standards, and I, I think that we've just lost uh, those objective standards today. You, you say objective standards. Would you, would you go so far as to say that the Lord was so big in their thinking, so prevalent in the way they thought, that they were just recognizing what they knew to be true about God's relationship with man, what God had gifted man with, in the liberty of his soul. It was not the invention of, if that's if right. that's your question. Right. In other words, to say to say that we invented this, they recognized it. Yes. It already existed, and it exists today, but not everyone recognizes it. And the struggle between Christians has many times been over our interpretation. We understand that, uh, but. We need that liberty to uh, to disagree with each other. Uh, so uh, uh, th there is variance. There is variance even among us. Dr. Samworth, would you like to comment on this same question that comes from this audience, the difference between tolerance and religious liberty? I was first going to uh, rev uh, invoke one of my rights under the Constitution, and that was to take the Fifth Amendment <laughs> to this question, but I think what has happened, we've lost the sense of authority and rule. It comes from the Word of God. It comes from the Word of God. But as Christians, we place ourselves under authority. And I think what we have today is just lawlessness. So therefore, I can do anything. I can say anything, do anything, uh, because I, there's no governing thing over my life. But when people place themselves under the law of God, and we are willing to abide by that, then there is at least the opportunity to discuss and see differences of opinion. But it's almost, uh, as Dr. Flick was uh, saying, in Darwinism, it's uh, the talon and, or the claw and others that are going to rule. So that it's going to be uh, determining what is right by might. And that completely makes us, uh, it's, it's almost into warfare, uh, rather than what does the word of God say? I'm under its authority, I recognize the liberty of another person is also under that. And so therefore we have a basis of working together. Otherwise, what do we have? But might makes right. When we are dealing with this subject, of course we have a biblical example in the book of Judges when every man is right in his own eyes. But uh, on theological terms, would you talk just a moment, Dr. Samworth, on antinomianism? And that, that, is, that is back in the forefront with Christians saying there is no rule, there is no law, there is no, no standards. Well, antinomianism um, it just simply means against the law. Well, whose law? It's the law of God. So we're talking about a view of living uh, on the part of people that 
at least have professed to be Christians. Um, and the idea is that we are saved by grace. We'd all agree there, right? Yes. Salvation is by grace, by faith alone in Christ. Uh, there's nothing that I contribute to that. So therefore, if I am free, uh, I have not done anything to merit or to earn or to keep my salvation. That means I can live as I please. Well, the word of God is very clear. Um, for example, I believe that antinomianism uh, really violates or uh, fails to come into understanding of what Paul writes to Titus when he talks about that the grace of God has appeared, uh, bringing salvation, and then the grace of God teaches us to deny all ungodliness. So the Christian is the freest, and yet at the same time, he is a slave to all. Martin Luther, back in 1520, uh, wrote three treatises, one of which was the freedom of the Christian man. And he said uh, that he is free from all, but he's under obligation. I'm truly saved by grace. I've done nothing, but the law of God is written in my heart, and I delight to do the will of God. I have a standard that remains uh, in the word of God to give me guidance and direction, but the Christian delights to do the will of God. Why? Because he's changed himself? No, God has changed him, giving him a new life. Uh, you think of the Lord himself uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, where he says, I delight to do thy will of God. That's the Christian Amen. life. And that Christian life is a life of joy and freedom and uh, liberty, but we're still obeying God's law because he's written it in our hearts. It's just, James talks about the law of liberty, the law of liberty. That's, that's, a, that's a powerful statement. Uh, no one could have done, I don't think, any better than Dr. Dr. Flick has done on the historical foundation for America. I, I want to ask you this. Did the, Dr. Flick, did the founding fathers believe that the Bible was a fixed point of reference? Yes, they did. Uh, there's, I have no question about that. Uh, if you take a look, that's one reason I try to deal with this in Founding Fathers, dealing with charters and uh, con uh, state constitutions, uh, because some of them are very vivid uh, in their statement, their affirmations of that. Um, and if I could go back to the Declaration, for, De Declaration of Independence for just a moment, there was a time in the church, and certainly early America was that time, uh, coming out of the Reformation era, where natural theology played, uh, had a tremendous impact. Uh, and that's the reason our founding fathers turned to what? The laws of nature and nature's God. It was their pastors were telling them uh, that, uh, that even the heathen was going to be accountable because of, because of nature. All of us are subject to law. My doctor seems to think that I'm subject to law. Uh, he says, Steve, unless you lose a little bit of weight, I'm going to have to put you on, you know, uh, blood pressure medicine. Yeah, I'm trying so, to lead to a question here. I have on my desk right now the reasonableness of Christianity by John Locke. And Locke has uh, had a great influence on our founding fathers. And what I'm, what I'm thinking in my life is that uh, the truth comes from generation to generation. Not our experience, but the, the truth is passed from generation to generation. As, as like Jefferson said even, they weren't creating something necessarily new. They were stating truths that already existed. But why, if they believe the Bible's a fixed point of reference, and why did they even state that we are a Christian nation. Why have we gotten so far removed and what part does the church or churches play in that? Can we all deal with that subject? I will return to the issue that I did raise from John Adams. 
he acknowledged that there was such division among the Christians, the various branches that, that I listed, that remained, even after the Great Awakening, there, there still was, uh, even though there was great... But we've, we've gotten the idea that the, the, the pastor and the church is like the tail on the donkey, you know? It, it's, it's, it's just, it's so almost, it's almost no influence, but we had times in this country where preachers thundering forth the word of God and the spirit of God moving on the land, it was the influence. It was the most influential thing. I'm saying, will revival, let's talk about that because we sit here and think about all that's wrong, but what can happen, what God could do to turn this thing around. Do you want to speak on that, Dr. Yeah, um, you know. By the way, I told him you were on a conversation trying to figure out what the president will do well, next. It's so. going to be some exciting stuff. They're, they're setting up a new foundation that's just being announced today um, with initiatives in several different places to help restore um, the, the true founding freedoms of our country and to, um, uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of, of um, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and it's very exciting. Um, I'm sorry I had to miss, but they set the time. <laughs> I didn't. Um, the the um, the important thing for us to understand about if you control the past, you control the future. And let me give you a vivid example of that. What Brother Sexton is talking about is a result of a mindset that was formed by a Supreme Court decision right after the Second World War that turned Jefferson's statement on its head. Jefferson, he said, he wrote the, he wrote the Baptist pastors in Danbury, Connecticut, who were, under, who were being persecuted by the state church in, in Connecticut. And he said, I believe in a separation of church and state. What he meant was the separation of the institution of the church and the institution of the state. He never meant the separation of religion and religious beliefs from public policy. But that's what the Supreme, the Supreme Court decision turned it on its head and had Jefferson become an ACLU separationist. And that myth has been propagated in our country for more than half a century now. And it has, it has altered our understanding uh, uh, as Americans of what the pastors are supposed to be able to do. I mean, I remember having a, I was having a debate uh, with um, the campus minister at Rice University um, back in, in, in the 1980s. And uh, um, we were debating the abortion issue. And he was just all offended. He said, why, why you're, you're violating separation of church and state. You, know, you can't bring morality into the question of abortion, religious, religious morality. And, I, and unfortunately for him, someone had handed me um, a statement that he had signed on to um, calling for him to spend, he was going to spend a significant amount of the rest of his ministry seeking to abolish nuclear weapons. And I said, now, why is it not a violation of separation of church and state? for you to spend a significant portion of your ministry trying to abolish nuclear weapons. But it is a violation of the Constitution for me to spend a significant portion of my ministry trying to defend unborn babies from being killed. Can I put a parenthesis in, in, in your statement yeah. here? Like for instance, is it even right for us to ask a, a Supreme Court nominee or somebody to say something like this, uh, will you promise us that your faith will have nothing to do with your decisions? Can you, can you eliminate yourself from your faith? Is that even a question? Should, I know Kennedy was asked that question yeah. in Texas when he'd run for office, and, and Amy Coney Barrett was asked those questions. In, as, as well, I, I, the answer is um, no. I mean, it, it, the, the, we, we can't ask someone to violate their conscience or to set aside their, their, their beliefs. And Kennedy actually had the best answer that a public policy servant, can, a public servant can give. Um, he did it in Houston. My, my, my pastor was there um, when, he, when he gave his answer to the ministers of Houston. Um, he said, you know, apparently I have to come and talk about this because people call me the Catholic candidate for president. I'm not. I'm the Democratic Party's candidate for president who happens to be a Catholic. But then he went on to say, some people, some people think that the Pope will tell me what to do. He won't. Even if, he threats to, even if he threatens to excommunicate me, I'm going to do what I believe is best for the country. But then he said, if my faith, 
He said, my, my views are formed by my faith. But if my faith caused me to need to make a decision that would be harmful to the country, I would resign the office rather than deny my faith or harm the country. And that's, that's exactly the kind of answer he should have given. Um, the idea that a person can separate themselves from their religious beliefs, I mean, the idea, to me, the worst position on abortion is the position that Jimmy Carter had. Not the only time he was totally wrong. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy said, well, I believe, I, I believe abortion's wrong, but I believe in separation of church and state. And so I don't think I should say anything about it. He was wrong about that. Well, he was. See, to me, I, can, I, I, I think it's even worse. People who actually don't understand that abortion's wrong, uh, at least they don't understand it's wrong. Jimmy understood it was killing a baby, but he thought separation of church and state kept him from doing anything about it, which is just a totally bankrupt morally idea. And behind um, that is the interpretation that the Supreme Court gave right. to separation of church and state. Not when uh, Jefferson explained a little about Jefferson and the cheese came well, and well, Jefferson oh yeah. wrote the letter. Well, Je Jefferson, um, Jefferson um, was... Um, he wrote this letter to the to the Baptist of Connecticut Danbury in Danbury, and and he um, he it went through three drafts, and and it, he circulated it to his cabinet. So it was really a policy position. He finished the third draft and signed off on it, and then he went outside, and John Leland had showed up at the White House. Now John Leland, after he left Virginia, because Virginia when, remember he was from. He was from Connecticut originally. He left Virginia, moved back to Massachusetts after Virginia very narrowly voted not to outlaw slavery in, in 1791. They almost did. Um, and he became very involved as a Democrat, uh, a Democrat Republican, and uh, campaigned for Jefferson tremendously in, Connecticut, in, in uh, Massachusetts, which was John Adams' home state. And that was probably the ugliest election. They were our, opposing one another. Yes, yeah, they and were. Statements, outrageous statements were made about. And 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 it was probably the probably the nastiest election we've ever had. I mean, I won't go into detail, but I mean, they called each other everything but an egg sucking dog. And 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 the press was just utterly irresponsible. And I mean, it was it was it was so bad that when Jefferson won, people in Massachusetts were burying their Bibles because they were told that Jefferson's party, were, they were gonna come get their Bibles. Well, um, Leland supported Je Jefferson. And so, uh, cause he'd fought with, he'd been with Jefferson in the fights against Virginia, um, the Virginia State Church. And so he led the, the Democrat Republicans of Western Massachusetts to build, to, to make a, a 1200 pound cheese. And they brought it down to Washington, and how would they do that? Oh, they did it by wagon. A wagon. And and Leland would take it. He'd go to about once, you know, about ten miles a day. Stop at a local place, and people would say, "Wow, look at that big cheese!" And he'd wait till a crowd gathered. And then he'd preach the gospel. He was an evangelist. Then the next day, he'd go to the to the next ten miles, and then you know he'd he'd preach a sermon. So finally, it was appointed that that very morning, that Jefferson signed that final document, he went out and 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 Leland showed up with this huge cheese and he, he said first of all uh, President Jefferson no Repub no no Federalist cows contributed any milk to this cheese only Democrat cows <laughs> and and he, he praised Jefferson thanked God for his being elected president and left him with the cheese and Jefferson went back in we don't know if he had any of the cheese for lunch now that was on Friday on the next Sunday John Leland preached a sermon from the speaker's rostrum of the House of Representatives chamber, which happened every Sunday until the 1850s. And Jefferson was sitting on the front row yeah. while the sermon went on. This, this supposed champion of separation of church and state had no problem with the sermon being preached from the speaker's rostrum. And he was there and, and one of the Federalist um, Episcopal ministers 
complained bitterly in a letter back to his constituents that this frontier bumpkin preacher preached with the holy wine um, that was characteristic of the frontier preacher. I'm not sure what the holy wine was, but evidently it wasn't the way that Episcopalian ministers talk. Um, and Jefferson was on the front row. So this idea that Jefferson was against uh, religion and morality, um, read, go to the Jefferson Memorial. Read what he says about slavery. Read on his tombstone. Well, on, 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 in the Jefferson Memorial, it says that, that he trembles for his country because it's written in the book of fate that, it, that these people are to be free and that slavery was a sin that, was going, that God was going to judge America for, which, of course, is what Abraham Lincoln said. Abraham Lincoln said, you know, that both sides in this war believe they're right. Neither side is completely right. And it may be that, that, that this war won't end until all of the ill-gotten gains that were taken from the sweat of other men's brow, both south and north, are used up. And, 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 and that, all that is cost. Will this, will this war end? Um, well, let's, let's our, our forefathers understood, they understood that morality and, and, and politics could never be separated. Somebody's morality is going to get legislated. Laws against murder are somebody's morality. Laws, laws against uh, racial discrimination. And, and the idea, well, well, you know, we can't, we can't impose our morality. Nonsense. Nonsense. Laws against, laws against murder, laws against theft, laws against rape, laws against abortion, laws against racial discrimination. Those are not between consenting adults in private. Somebody's doing something to somebody else against their will, and the government is saying, you can't do that, and if you do that, you're going to be punished. Where, where do we go from here? Now, we talked about our first freedom. We've talked about today being a Christian nation. We're talking about the providence of God bringing America together. Now, we want people to use bits and pieces. They're using bits and pieces of our history against us. Um, what about politics today? You, you can't help that you're white or your friend is black or so all the racial innuendos that come through the political life today and the equality versus equity, uh, that's an issue that this generation is going to have to deal with. So what's the foundation for dealing with that? Uh, Herb? <laughs> he just, he just motioned me. <laughs> well, the foundation for dealing with everything is right here. The word of God. That, that may be a truism. It might be a generalization. But it's when God's people truly believe this word, act upon it, pray to God, and determine to live as we should. Mm -hmm. When we think of church history, uh, two things, very quickly, there was a very close connection between 1859, when the origin of species was published by Charles Darwin, and the rise of German higher criticism that destroyed, well, it didn't destroy, but, well, destroyed people's faith in the Word of God. And when people lose faith in the Word of God, we're in deep, deep trouble. So you're saying yeah. the return to that it's is a what we need. It's yeah. a return to it. And, and just one further thing. Um, in the second, third centuries, and, and I think, as someone has said, we're living more in the third, second and third centuries right. concerning Christianity than we'd like to admit. Right. What, what did they have? They had no printing press, it wasn't invented. They had no political influence, but they had the word of God, probably not, uh, well, it was a manuscript if you had one, but it was in your heart. You knew it. You didn't even have a copy of the Bible. But they lived it out and they changed the world, they choose, excuse me, they changed the Roman Empire 
through the sheer lives of the people. And of course, there were martyrs and there were uh, spokespersons, but it was the life, the quality of life of the Christians that changed the Roman Empire. So the answer, part of our answer is in the past, what, what, what God used in the past, but these things are reoccurring. Yes. They're reoccurring things. Let, let, I, think, I think, first of all, it would help if we would just sit down and talk about the fact that the Bible tells us there's only one race, That's right. the human race. But we're talking about our different ethnicities. Um, the human race is one race. You know, it, now science is proving that Eve is the mother of all living. Right. And 99.99% of all human beings are the same in terms of their genetic structure. Um, we, we, uh, we are all part of the human family. And so racism is a human construct by the devil himself. And um, sexism, same way. Um, now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm a, a object of three different prejudices. Um, I'm, 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 you know, I'm white, so they're against me because I'm white. That's racism. They're against me because I'm old. That's ageism. And they're against me because I'm a male. That's, that's sexism. I mean, I get, I get all three. Doesn't bother me any. It's like water off a duck's back. But um, we, need to, we need to counter this by, by saying, look, we're all, you know, all men are created equal. And they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these is the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What now, happens, Dr. Land, is people get assaulted with these yes. accusations and then they're quiet. This meeting is to help us be able to speak well, Don't be truth. quiet. Don't be quiet. You, you accuse them of being bigots. They're the biggest. They're, they're bigots against religion. Uh, and they're bigots against uh, any belief system. They're, they, they, you see... It's a, a long war against God, isn't in it? A, in a society where they claim there are no absolutes, the one thing they cannot tolerate are people who believe in absolutes. Mm -hmm. And that's us. We believe that some things are always wrong and some things are always right. And we need to remind them that in a society where nothing is always wrong and nothing is always right, anything's possible. And I want to leave you with this thought. Why is it that we're so focused as a society, fixated almost, on what happened in Germany between 1933 and 1945? Now, it was terrible. But what happened in the Soviet Union was worse. They killed a whole lot more people. What happened in communist China was, was a lot worse. They killed 50 million people. The reason we're fixated by it is it happened in Germany, which at the time was the most scientifically advanced, educationally advanced country in the world. They had 100% literacy. As you all know, we don't have 100% literacy in the United States today. If you wanted to be the best doctor after you finished American medical school, you went to Germany to do postgraduate work. And the reason we beat the Russians to the moon is our, Russians, our, our Russian scientists were better than their Russian scientists. What, what, what happened in Nazi Germany shows us that it doesn't matter how educated you are, doesn't matter how cultural you are, when you forget, when you leave God behind or you turn away from God, you begin to worship yourself and anything's possible. Anything's possible. Their scientific expertise just allowed them to kill more effectively. Um, that's why it scares us. That's why, that's why, that's why what happened in Germany scares us. Cause if it can happen in Germany, it can happen anywhere. It can happen. We're going to have this panel tomorrow if we live and the Lord doesn't come. But if you've got questions that you think I really would like to get the answer to this at, at the foundation of this conference is, is, um, answers that we need that will empower us to be able to serve the Lord like we want to serve the Lord and face the opposition that we face today.